Okay, everybody. Sorry. <laughs> Let's get going here for the uh, Conservation Commission meeting for Wednesday, September 6th. Uh, we are recording, and if you are recording, please let us know. Uh, if you have cell phones on, please put them on silence. It would be appreciated. Um, we're going to start with the public meeting, public comment, items not being heard on tonight's agenda. Anything anybody wants to bring up? Okay, great. So now we're going to go into the public hearing notice of intent. We have two continuances an intent from the Nantucket Island Land Bank, 17 Commercial Wharf, and one of the unnumbered lots on New Wales Street. It's <coughs> continued till 10 4. What is 10? November? October. October. October 4th, 2017, and 36 Lily Street, LLC, 36 and 36B Lily Street. It's continued till September 20th. So uh, we also have in the amended orders are continuing until <coughs> September 20th as well with Steve L. Cohen, trustee, 6872 Monmoy Road. So we're going to start off with the Nantucket Pond Coalition, Eastern Shore of Hummock Pond. Mr. Chair, I'm recused. Okay. Commissioner Steinhardt is recused. Go right ahead. Please introduce yourself. I'm Bob Lee from the Pond Coalition, and I think we'll continue to Yes, we have received both the sign-off from Natural Heritage and the DEP. Wow. We did talk about um, glyphosate studies effects on birds. Is that what you want? Uh, no, I actually didn't realize my son was going to look into that per se. Uh, and I know where I that for an audience. I thought we were waiting for that. Yeah, I mean, that's what I remember. It yeah, I remember too. I, yeah, I looked a little bit in an uneducated form on the internet. And I don't trust the internet. Yeah, no, that's not what I remember. I, I, I know I talked to Dr. Lennon about it, and that he was not aware of any specific right. scientific source for stuff I was seeing was mostly uh, talking about habitat, you know, loss of habitat and stuff, decrease the number of birds. That right. Possible. And we had that discussion yeah. last time, and the subject of habitat came up, <coughs> but it sort of was negated by invasives don't qualify. Right. Technically, they technically don't. Right. And we're only doing 4,000 acres out of the pond, which is like 26,000. Yeah. 26,000. Do you have like a five, ten year plan for this? Yeah. I've never done it before, so it's sort of hard to predict. But we're in year four of the pilot, three of the pilot. Projects like this, and I've done a great deal of research on wetland reconstruction. And if these projects are successful, and generally they're not for a variety of reasons, but one reason is people haven't outlined that five year plan, that 10 year plan with this is our treatment protocol, 
these are the areas we anticipate native species revegetating right away. These are maybe the bird species we displace for the first two years until vegetation was growing back in. But my feeling is, um, and this is just from watching the video and reading, I would personally like to see the Madikit project go through a little bit further because this one doesn't have the detail to progress for me. And it is a, an extreme financial commitment to make them successful. For me, I guess I'd like to see who's doing it then. You know, like a true outline of the five year, mm -hmm. three year really for us because that's okay. the length of our permit. Probably there should be help with dimension that in all these projects there are residents, not conservation people, but people that live there who have separate personal responsibility to stay mm -hmm. with this for as long as they want to come. So in the case of Dr. Stoke, they could go out and it. In the case of um, the other group that wants to do something, I guess my one concern is that the only goal is to eradicate Phragmites and we're not maybe looking at the bigger ecosystem picture. So. Well, uh, I mean, I'm not a biologist, but from my perspective, at least my, in terms of meeting with the people that most of the council are very interested in conservation, not just Phragmites. on both sides about nutrients having been found, lived experience of living there and now still living there. Um, a lot of discussion about whether the plants pick up nutrients before they get to the pond. Um, a lot of viewpoints about both the pros and the cons of it all. Um, and I think you're in touch with all those people who are all those who listen to all those who care about those. Um, but at the end of the day, we need to live in town to take it home and decide we're not going to take it home. I think that's the choice that they make. Like I asked her this year, you're scared of the things you live in. You don't want to take them out. You don't want to take them out. So I think that's the choice that they have to make. Any other questions? Public comment? through <coughs> the chair to the proponent of the project. Um, one is, is there a pond of a similar size and similar um, amount of invasive um, Phragmites where it has truly been eradicated utilizing <coughs> this product? Yes. And where is that? <coughs> oh, sorry. Well, I don't have the chart with me, but I think in the notice of intent for the pilot program, Included charts of prior efforts that were done, mostly by conservation associations, but like most of the conservation foundation, and they varied from 10 acres to over 100 acres, or about 20 of them were listed. And um, there were also letters from the um, heads of those foundations and 
underway before eradication was totally completed? I don't know the answer to that because the testimony has been taken over time. But that's what we need to find out. I think that would be an interesting thing to find out about. But I think if the spirit of the question is, has this been done before and is it successful, the potential answer to that is unquestionably yes. I think that one of the things that I know I brought up last time was I think it would be nice to sort of finish up the other two projects that are still ongoing before we jump into even a bigger project and find out what the results are and sort of the growback rate and all of that. Because as I understand it, the seeds are carried by the wind into the water and then it's all moved around. So it seems like it's sort of almost a forever kind of project. So I'd be very interested in seeing sort of how it's working out on Nantucket and knowing those places where it's been 100% totally eradicated forever and how long that took and what the ramifications were. I took the time to actually call National Natural Heritage and I spoke with Dave Paulson, who is not the person that wrote the letter saying that this project could go ahead as far as they were concerned. And he indicated that National Natural Heritage, in fact, was unaware of the existence of Sora, American bittern, marsh wren, or pied-billed grebe, as well as some of the other bird species that I mentioned. So they've not come down and mucked around in there. So they didn't actually know that those things were there. And because this project didn't include any, or the other two projects, include any sort of a bird component, if you will, sort of what's going on with their lives out there, Natural Heritage has no idea those things are even there or in the other two bodies of water. I think, again, through the chair to the proponent, the timing of the application of the product is of concern to me. As I indicated in the letter that you guys got, and I apologize, I stood up and was talking crazy last week because you guys had never actually seen that letter, and I thought you had, so you probably had no clue what I was talking about, so sorry. But anyway, the swallows, the hundreds of thousands of swallows that show up, not to mention the other birds that are already living there, but these guys that show up by the boatload, they usually arrive first week-ish in September. I've been checking, they aren't here in big numbers yet, so there is some variables. But I think the proponent had mentioned that he thought that September might be a little bit too late and that he might want to do his application earlier. So I would love to know when the dates are that the person, that the proponents want to do this application, because I think in the information that you got, it was, the dates were in September, if I'm remembering it. Yeah, so I think that would be good to tie that down if you guys are interested in not having stuff being sprayed when the swallows are there. September 11th is perfect. So that's two weeks earlier than the date that you requested. So depending year to year, the swallows could be there on that date. There was definitely some concern from what I read also about the general pollen that it might at some point be sort of in a window when it appears it's going to start blooming and so forth. Because there is some group of insects that that's consistent with. So I guess you're saying too. So from that point of view, it's probably the later the better, but I'm just wondering what the timing is. Did you try and balance that one out? Okay. Do we have any other questions from the public? Any other questions from the commission? So we have everything we need to know. Yeah, we have all the required information. Are we ready to close? Do we have a motion? Move to close. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Todd Johnson, 37 Miller Road.
still do, which we did on Monday, uh, with a good chunk of the commission. Uh, and that also was after this revised plan was filed with the commission. So. Brian Madden from LEC. Um, and I think some of those updates um, were relative to the uh, pool, patio, and fencing around that area. So I think it was pulled closer to the house. Yes. And I think um, there was some conversations about like wetland scenic views at the last meeting, but I think you guys went out there, and, um, at least from what I saw. Uh, public roadways are surrounding areas. comment on the wetland scenic view thing. It's kind of hard for me to imagine a pool that's in the ground affecting wetland scenic views given all the huge houses out there and especially that big line of junipers that pretty much blocks the view to the road. So, I mean, the only place I think you might see that pool is if you were in Sarah or in the um, house on the field station with the pair of binoculars, you know, you might interrupt your view, but... Um, Seemed like to me, it seemed like a non issue. I don't know. <coughs> Are they not worried? Do you know more with this? Second floor lighting um, and like bird strikes and things like that with big windows. Um, you're trying to keep light away from the wetland side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, light should be yeah. addressed. Yeah. I'd like to change the window. Yes. quickly we did get a letter in today and he said that he uh, was unable to make it from the weather because he was traveling from off island um, he was here last time mr. Fisher um, wanted to um, reiterate his questions on kind of the lack of pools in the neighborhood um, and I'm just trying to read it quickly and get to him is whether there's any extensive hardscaping on the marsh side of residential structures and he answers his question with no. Um, and then he would just say um, he's concerned about the commission permitting a pool and hardscaping um, that would change the nature of Folger's Marsh. So he just, because he was able to make it, I just wanted to make sure that I got it on the record for him. And um, since it just came in at 3.20 this afternoon, we have a chance to get it to you guys. <coughs> Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it does. Little kids can't climb the wall. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> Pretty sure my six-year-old would hurdle that wall. That's the theory. Okay. Brian, do you know if there's like a, a neighborhood, um, what do they call it when you build in a neighborhood and you basically say you're not going to have a clothesline or you're going to have this kind of association. Yeah. Yeah. And did they have an agreement not to have pools? Uh, I'm not aware of any. Uh, and I don't know I if that's not our deal. I, I, would, I would give the speech of saying that is well outside of our <laughs> purview to enforce um, homeowner agreements and covenants and those kinds of things. I'm just wondering if we should tell this gent to, he should go to the planning board or the zoning board or he should hire a lawyer. We have pointed him in multiple of those directions, okay. whether it's HDC or or a private issue. We've said we have a very limited purview to review these projects, and sometimes concerns aren't always addressed. But they fit elsewhere. Call John Hedden at the HDC. Okay. Okay. Yes.
the applicant. Um, I believe uh, the only thing we were waiting for was natural heritage, which uh, we did receive for the no adverse effect, no no take. Um, I guess we'll just turn over to the questions if there are any. areas involved, um, the uh, existing conditions at the site, and then the uh, proposed project components themselves, <coughs> together with uh, a, a comprehensive information package here that's included with all, all the components that's proposed by uh, the state architecture for this project. Coastal engineering prepared two of the plans in, in the four plan package. One is existing conditions survey of the conditions out there. And then the next plan is a proposed site plan, which mirrors pretty much what the landscape architect is proposing for the project. Uh, the coastal engineering involvement is to take that uh, information and then also augment the proposal with uh, and address the stormwater management uh, component of the project. Just as of some brief history for the project, uh, this site does been in existence for quite some time. It's filled tidelands for the most part. Um, it, uh, it carries both of these projects uh, have a valid uh, um, chapter 91 or previous to that the Department of Public Works license for the bulkheads that exist out there on, on both of these properties. They date back to about 1928-1929. Uh, those licenses cover dredging in the harbor and bulkheading and filling There's been a long history of structures and teardowns and rebuilds. Then 27 Easy Street consisted of the Arnold property, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. There's been a long history before this commission and the state. Uh, and uh, not too long ago, the, the land bank purchased that property and did tear down the building and revegetated the site to, with a lawn area to put the project on, on just on standby until a more uh, comprehensive uh, landscape plan uh, the land bank was also uh, successful very recently in purchasing 21 Easy Street, which contains existing dwelling and uh, related grounds. So that's, uh, that's why we have a, a line dividing the site. It's two separate properties which are now combined as uh, one property. The, uh, the idea of the project is to remove structures. It's, it's, the, it's the basis of what the land bank, bank does remove existing structures, open up new sheds, and open up the entire property to uh, public access. <coughs> and in this particular case, the public access concept consists of three components uh, as shown on the plan. One is uh, timber decking along the waterfront that has fingers that extend back towards Easy Street that allow uh, access ramps to, to allow uh, handicap accessible graded ramps to get from the deck elevation, which is only a foot or so above the ground surface, to get uh, on a slope of less than 1 in 20, which is the criteria for uh, handicap accessible uh, grading, down to uh, adjoining brick sidewalk uh, that has fingers that uh, extend towards the water and join up with these, uh, these various timber fingers. The areas in between both of those structures is a proposed vegetation areas. And there's a pretty uh, comprehensive proposal for the landscaping portion of the project. Um, the, the landscaping portion consists of uh, three levels of vegetation, the overstory tree level, the, the, the uh, 
shrubbery or bush level, and then the, uh, the ground cover. I, 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 I think we'll let Rachel expand on that a little bit in, in, the, in the next few minutes. This project uh, wanted to uh, accom accommodate the town's uh, situation where the sidewalk along this entire property is quite narrow. In my, in my own coming and goings, it's quite narrow. You have to step down off the, the sidewalk if it, onto the road sometimes with people coming and going. And this concept includes a, a, a removal and resetting or replacement of concrete curbing or resetting of existing granite curbing so that the entire stretch here, which extends about 230 feet across these two properties to uh, greatly improve the, the curb, realign it, uh, set the grade properly again, and then uh, reinstall uh, the, the brick sidewalk to the, to the town of Nantucket standards uh, as shown on the plan. This concept also includes the widening to about eight feet along the stretch to coincide with the widening that's already occurred in the area of the new uh, bulkheading that was recently done uh, right next uh, to 21 Easy Street. Uh, I had an opportunity to talk to the DPW director, uh, Robert O'Neill, and uh, asked him if he would have permission to do that, and he was uh, delighted to hear that the landlord would, would do that work. Uh, so we would have to coordinate with the on the public works uh, on the project. <coughs> the stormwater drainage concept uh, presently at the site is that the lot slopes slightly from uh, harbor side, slightly down towards the sidewalk, and then down into the catch basins. There are two existing catch basins along the front of the, the property in the road, and those catch basins are tied into the stormwater drainage system, which then continues on and out through the, the new uh, Penetrations, the outfall uh, pipes that are built into the, the brand new uh, bulkhead that was recently installed next door. Um, we looked at this project and knew we had to do something with relation to uh, stormwater management. I had done a whole series of test pits myself out there to determine what the soils are and determine the proximity of groundwater. Groundwater is approximately about 20, 22 inches below the ground surface, so very, very shallow. Um, the site is really not that amenable to a formal stormwater drainage system, catch basin and any kind of leaching because of the high groundwater and the, uh, the relatively uh, uh, shallowness to, to the groundwater. So recognizing that this project is deemed under the uh, stormwater management regulations to be uh, a, a redevelopment project which allows an engineer to uh, uh, attain relief from many of the provisions in the stormwater management policy. Uh, and the, the proponent is only required under the regulations to, to improve the stormwater drainage runoff situation to the maximum extent practicable is the terminology used. So, so with that in mind, uh, that proponent of the stormwater management policy and then the site characteristics here, we produced a stormwater management report that in essence uh, describes how stormwater runoff from the site uh, is being handled. And that is, there's, there's three major components in the project. We know that the uh, brick paving is essentially impervious, so we have to take that into account. And that it area is, is uh, expanding over what was there previously just along the town portion of the sidewalk. However, uh, there's a proposed decking area here, which in our calculations and in our, in our design philosophy, Th this structure will be uh, built with space between the individual boards and we will have keystone under so any storm water that falls on any of the timber portions of decking and ramps will, will pass through the decking and get captured at the site and percolate into the ground 100%. Um, also, there are large areas, vegetated areas proposed, there's three across the site or four actually across the site that, and these vegetated areas constitute about 62% of the area on the site. So. With the, with the extensive vegetation that's being proposed and the uh, nature of the vegetation, it's, it's, it's not really like a lawn where you do have a runoff component. I think those areas will afford uh, extremely high um, ability to capture stormwater and maintain it on the site and percolate it directly into the ground. And that's kind of an overview of our stormwater management uh, report. Uh, uh, I think that's the most practical uh, solution here. There's really no way to we don't have much grade difference. In other words, uh, the site only slopes uh, a 
foot or so or less from the water side to the street. The, the curb is presently about elevation three along the entire length, elevation three. Um, storm water flood elevation is 11. This is well, well, below, uh, well, well below the 100 year flood elevation for the project. The resource areas that are impacted by this project um, essentially consist of three resource areas. One is uh, land subject to coastal storm flowage. One is coastal bank, which in effect is the, is the bulkhead on the site. And then uh, because the landscape architecture <coughs> architect <coughs> is, is proposing that we introduce uh, timber piles uh, to, to have that kind of appearance from the harbor to, to mimic, which is already existing in the new bulkhead over uh, in the new section uh, recently installed by the town. Those piles actually penetrate the bottom right up against the bulkhead, and so that's uh, uh, that's a resource area uh, that we have to uh, deal with in, in our, uh, in our uh, analysis of the project. The project is essentially quite benign. We're taking a, a, a site, a combined site that has had some very hard usage over a long period of time and introducing a new uh, uh, benign type project that provides 100% public access to the site. Uh, in your packet, there was all kinds of uh, additional information on hardscape provided by the landscape architect of the, of the details of the benches, the lighting, the uh, um, information on um, bike racks, uh, other, other components of, components of the project. One interesting item on the project is uh, mimicking of where the old original trolley line and portions used to be across the site. They'd be embedded in the, in the brickwork in, in two locations of the trolley line that used to go out to the, the Steamship Authority site uh, in, in times gone by. Um, the, the project is, is quite benign. I know uh, uh, There'll be some questions about what and how and, and uh, the layout and that sort of thing, but uh, <coughs> it's it's a project that's going to be very well received by the DEP. Uh, we we did send over a letter uh, that was uh, sent to the land bank from Ben Lynch, the program director of the, of the waterways program, the waterways program, and in that letter he himself had designated this this project to be a water dependent project. Uh, he did mention we have following successful completion of the Conservation Commission, if we're fortunate to, to receive an order of conditions, then we would continue on and then have to go and do a filing with the DEP for a new Chapter 91 license as a water dependent, and that's, that's a key word, water dependent project. So we, we have that uh, we have that designation already. And that, I think, has some bearing on whether or not we need to apply for waivers or not for the project from the, the uh, Nantucket Conservation Commission.
cement portion into that, right. that seal, right. that, that, that closure section in the, in the voids between the bricks. That's I'd, even say, I'd just say, even go a step further and spec a different brick. Yeah, I would look into it. I, I mean, I think it has a, a real opportunity to, 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 to be very comprehensive and, and, and even better designed than, mm -hmm. than is commonly used in town. I think any other specification is super cool. Yeah. Well, I think it's worth looking into. Okay. Well, I had a question about the, the cap on the retaining wall. You're going to keep it low and it will have a space. It looks like you have like a, an 8x8 eight eight or something. I know you got tapered down from the work that was done next door uh, recently. But you're not going to have that same high sort of increase the height just of that wall there any more than just that. just in one corner. There's a detail that shows yeah. uh, where we, where we match up in this yeah. area here. We keep the same height for short section, and that's an area where the landscape actors proposing that uh, carved into the side could be uh, uh, historic heights of past. Oh, yeah. Stone or something. Yeah, just on that short section. Yeah. yeah. My concern was uh, water retention. If we, if we start armoring, raising the height all around. No, it's, it's we're pretty much going to stay the great. the, the, the uh, timber curve along there would be um, mm -hmm. up on the uh, short sections to create scuffle effects. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like the Of samples of everything, yeah, so and, and any information that I need. Yeah, I was just concerned about the tension. So it's like nice to have the water. Yeah. Yeah. Water. Right. I know the town raised their yeah, issues about there. overwash on the road in that section. It's so close the there.
but I do think that these were selected based on you know, the capacity of downtown to have an ornamental species as well as native species, um, the extreme environment, and um, you know, again, giving a nod to native plants and working in some conservation value here. So that's where we went with this planting philosophy here. There's a lot of plants being put in on the site. Um, I mean, I guess just personally, since you are the land bank and we are held in high regard here. Like when I see you have 22 native clethora, but then you've added 46 of the hummingbird variety, I feel like you guys should be showing the town of Nantucket, here's the native, it's beautiful. That's all we need to incorporate, you know? And then you're right on the harbor, so like you have the nitrogen issue as well, and the more natives you have, the less pollution, the less problems in the harbor. So I know that there are a lot of ornamentals downtown, but you know, the land bank should be curbing that view and saying these natives are beautiful, we're protecting the harbor, we're doing all these things. I so. mean, I think the varieties are probably pretty minimalist in terms of, that's actually what most of them chose. Mm -hmm. I know they're not a native variety, but you know, that they were chosen for the fact that they will tolerate low nutrient conditions. Um, I do, I, I know what you're saying. Um, and, you know, this, this was developed over the course of the last six months with a lot of input from a lot of different people. And uh, this is the planting plan that we felt would fit best on this site. I guess the way that I feel about um, cultivars in protected resource areas, I'm more about them not escaping into the wild than I am about how they might look. Not that I hear totally what you're saying, Ashley. That I would like to be the land bank that's in charge on designing with Nate more in mind. Uh, I'm less concerned on this side that they're going to escape into into an area and sort of colonize. Um, so I'll say that. But by the same token, it would be nice to have it a little more in balance, natives to non-natives. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's certainly something we can discuss. I have, I have no problem you know, bringing that back to our landscape architect and seeing what they can do. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I do think that we do make an effort, and we do have some areas where we really make an effort to do native species. And we, the land bank, and this is what I always go back to, the land bank has a huge range of properties from downtown parks all the way to conservation lands. And we would never, ever, ever put a non-native plant in a conservation area. Um, you know, we go out of our way to remove invasive species in various areas. Mm -hmm. But we do feel like there are certain locations where, you know, more ornamental varieties may have a place. Um, and, you know, some, I don't want to say historic value, but in keeping with the surrounding environment. You know, it may not, I'm, I'm not trying to say that the land bank shouldn't uphold the standard of conservation values, but I do think that um, it's in keeping with downtown in general to not have a straight conservation, you know, native species garden, um, because that would be an unusual thing that would kind of stand out. And I'm not necessarily defending the land bank's, you know, choices here. I'm just saying that, that that's, I think, was part of the reason that this planting selection was made, um, because it did incorporate some, but not everything, and did have some species, which we do see in gardens on Nantucket, um, which is primarily the downtown area, you know, I mean, landscaping is huge in Nantucket, we all know that. It's one of the most heavily landscaped areas that I know of <laughs> in the United States. Um, so, but it's definitely something we could re review our species if you're interested in seeing um, more native plants. We could definitely review them. I mean, I definitely am from a needing irrigation standpoint and fertilizer, education, all of the above. I mean, our intention is not to really fertilize this property. Our intention, like I said, is to use the leaf compost and actually start with very good soil. Um, so that's how we're going to be working with it. I think we would have to irrigate just about anything to start with. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, I don't, I don't know about this site, but in general, what we usually do with sites that are really challenging is we end up irrigating between July 15th and you know September 1st or something like that, mm -hmm. if we have to. Um, and then we shut it off. So, but that's primarily on sites where we have a real issue, um, and it's unusual. And the 
this might be a situation like that, or that's how I see it playing out. It's going to be hot there. Is where it's, it's kind of a seasonal irrigation. Um, is there lawn in the area, or is it all planted in the interior? There is no lawn. No lawn at all in the interior? No. Yeah, it's all planted. Okay. Uh, lighting? You had mentioned I also got to the lighting. Yes, our, our small down lights. It's very, it's in the low, very low. There's one existing lamp post which will get relocated and kept on this and it's present in the home. For safety yeah, mostly. It just moves the exactly yeah. keep that. That's uh, otherwise there's uh, low there level lighting. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd seen that yeah, one. Yeah. 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 And down. Yeah. 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 Y
but signage about the railway that needs to be there, signage about these plants and the benefits. It's a teaching area, and it's, it's like, a, like I said, a, an amazing opportunity. We are going to have signage about the um, railroad, the history of the railroad, and the flood, the height of the flood. Yeah, would be great Water. to tell people about the plant. Young, uh, I'm probably one of only the one of the, one of the few neighbors who are affected uh, by this project. And the, the project that I worked for many years with Todd Arna, who was both a, a neighbor, a lifetime neighbor, and a friend. <coughs> um, I know that you protect wetland views, and I assume that the Easy Street Basin North Wharf area is a, a, a view that should be protected. Uh, the proposal here, and I don't know if you've looked at it horizontally, but they're talking about, I think there are 13 honey locusts they want to plant on that property. I think that's a huge amount of trees to put on a small piece of property like that. And where, they, where they're going to impact the view is when I look out the window, I don't look out from seven feet down. I look out all the way to the sky. And when you go down to that street in the morning and the sun's coming up over the harbor, be amazed the number of people down there taking photographs. And they're not just taking photographs from eye level, under a tree. And so I think that if there's any way for you to, to consider the impact of the number of trees, I'm not saying get rid of all the trees. I think there are places for trees down there for sure. But I think 13 trees in that little triangle is going to be a lot of trees. And they're going to block a lot of view. Not, they're not going to block that view, but they're going to block the view, this view when the sun comes up, when the birds are going by, or what have you. So uh, I just want you to take that into consideration. If it's all within your purview at all, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It is an interesting um, question, though. Why there are, do seem to be quite a few trees on the site, and <coughs> what effect is that? Is it more for effect? Is it for shade, for plants, for people? What, what's the reason? Partly for shade for the plants, but mostly for shade for people. Um, the species that we planted under them do require kind of a dapple shade uh, or proposed to plant under them. What we did try and do, though, were leave um, definite view shed corridors between the trees. Um, what we've noticed spending time down in that area is that when you're standing on that site in the summertime, it is just devoid of any sort of shade at all. And it can be incredibly hot downtown in general. Uh, and there's not a lot of trees in this one area along the water's edge. And so we proposed putting in a few trees to enable people's experience to be more pleasant. Uh, to, be at some, to make it someplace people want to come sit. You want to come sit under a shady tree on a hot day. Um, you don't want to sit out in the bright sun downtown so that was that was mostly our rationale behind it. But definitely, we, we made an active effort to allow view shed corridors from many different angles, and the trees were were placed really carefully for that exact reason. Um, and again, that was part of the reason for the honey locust, is you can actually see through the canopy of a honey locust more than you can see through a canopy of a lot of other species.
Good afternoon. Mark Ritz from Site Design, representing the applicant at 156 Orange. Um, what you have for you today is an NOI requesting approval to construct a secondary dwelling associated with landscaping and grading outside the 50 foot buffer zone to a wetland on the site. The wetland was previously delineated under an RDA, and this, this work had actually been previously approved. The uh, prior approval expired back in December. Uh, we have re flagged the wetland, re surveyed the site. I believe Jeff was out there and confirmed the extent of the wetland. Um, we have a silt fence outside of the 50 foot buffer. This entire area, pretty much up to the wetland, is, is currently lawn and has been lawn for, for many, many years. Um, so we're basically proposing to do some grading and construction of a secondary out outside the 50. Uh, the, the bulk of the, um, there is a little bit of grading and work um, inside the 50. All structures are outside of the 50. Um, Grading is relatively minor. We're just straightening out a few contours here in an area that, that's currently lawn and reseeding it as as before. Nothing, no changes inside the 25. Structure on the property, <coughs> and the proposal is to remove the um, existing dwelling and to um, build a new house on the property. Um, as part of that, the existing septic system will be abandoned. Um, currently, the leach pit is only about 50 feet from the um, top of the coastal bank, which is defined by um, contour seven, elevation seven. And uh, an entirely new system will be uh, pushed uh, easterly away from the pond, uh, so there will be about a 450 foot separation between the new leach field and the pond. Um, the property is subject to a um, conservation restriction, which um, defines the location of where structures can be built. So we're um, uh, proposing to rebuild within the existing. Envelope of the CR. Um, there's only about 250 square feet of um, <coughs> grading proposed between the 25 and 50 foot um, setbacks to the coastal bank, which are uh, very minimal. And um, it's kind of long and short. Uh, No, no, everything is... So that's just the ring. So the porch comes right over here? Yes, on the lower section of the house. The southerly part of the house, it's the it's porch the will the approach. Section. Yeah. Yeah. The label is just outside the porch. Yeah. Is that yeah. box, is that the, the restrict, restriction yeah. to where yeah. things can be? It's the, yes. the, the building envelope, yeah. essentially? That rectangle yeah. right there.
there a way to release a response? Yeah, all of Tuckanock is map habitat, so. Uh, questions from the public? Yeah, we need to continue for two weeks to get that. Howitz, 323 Pulpus Road. So the applicant, Mark Gasparro, I am before you tonight uh, with a notice of intent um, <clears throat> for work within uh, an existing residential yard located out uh, of the works within the 100 foot buffer zone to uh, bordering vegetated wetlands. Uh, well, it essentially runs along the cranberry bogs out in Pulpus. And um, on the plan, I have the proposed elements shown in red and the um, 25, 50, and 100 foot buffer zones shown in blue. Uh, the proposed project is essentially a, a landscape, hardscape project. We're removing an existing swimming pool and replacing it uh, with a new pool. Um, there's a pergola that's proposed, goes out of the jurisdiction. I'm going to reconfigure some uh, retaining walls, remove some walls. The, um, uh, the work is proposed, all work and disturbance is outside of the 25. A portion of the existing pool fence is within the 50. We're proposing to, uh, to leave that fence where, where it currently is, and uh, we would just run a sill fence along the inside of that fence. Um, the, uh, I believe the project likely would have been an RDA, except they have requested a waiver for separation distance to groundwater. Um, I believe that the um, bottom of the pool would be approximately at the elevation of, of the groundwater, so we wouldn't have that two foot separation distance. Uh, per an earlier um, hearing that we had, I, I've shown, uh, as you can see, the spot elevation along the wetland flags, which are down around elevation 12. Um, and the uh, surface of the pool is up around 21. So that gives you a sense of the, um, uh, the, the distance that we have there. And I figure that the, um, uh, the pool, the excavation, based on the details I was provided, would be about nine feet. So that puts us right around there. Uh, any dewatering, if it's even needed, uh, to preserve that deep end would be um, outside of the, the buffer zone. Uh, I don't believe that there'd be any adverse impacts or So they just weren't going to change it. Right. The only thing I proposed was to put a sill fence along it because it seemed like the most logical spot to, you know, it's it's the edge of disturbance and rocks and everything you know. And so it's not into the 25, so I thought it made sense. In, in our inspection, it's a, a fence that looks like it's been there a while. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty well grown in and stuff's grown all over it. And it's not shiny new by any means. Uh, only so much, I would say, I should answer those up. Um, the, the wall that's there is um, uh, a bit more of a sitting wall, mm -hmm. and so um, I had asked that, that question originally thinking it was retaining, but it's actually sort of impacts the views going out and over, so they told me that it would just roll you know, off. Certainly no, you know, uh, any, any grade change would be slight modification of the landscaping there, but again, no disturbance even into the 25. Any questions from the public? Wow. <laughs> Any challenge. Okay. Jeff, we have everything we need here to close? We do. Are you ready to close? Yes, please. Motion to close. Second. 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 All those in favor? Thank you. Okay. So, amended orders are continued, so we're going into the public meeting. Request for determination. On Stalgard, 33 Madigate Road. Uh, Brian Madden from LEC. Um, application for you is an RDA to confirm the BBW boundary. It's um, been established out there. The property is uh, currently used as um, is a, a barn and horse paddock area. There's Road and the double of the center. 
uh, which extends into a little bit beyond the paddock area, so one of the paddock areas. Um, and so it's primarily based off of I'd say we, we went out and inspected and verified that the data forms and the soil information. Um, but I would also say that it is some hard, hard soil. It's rough digging. There was a 36 year old horse. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> It's an interesting site. I mean, it's definitely, uh, as you look back onto the back of the site, there's all these, you know, interesting spots on the pasture where they kind of mowed and managed over years. Then there's strips of, like, mm -hmm. cattails on the one side, and the other side that runs down the middle is a lot of goldenrod. And, um, it's kind of, it's kind of a, yeah, it's kind of is a cool pasture site. Monument, no, no, uh, no, this is the... Um, not the monument, not the monument. Yeah, the red... Yeah. Yeah. Red Cavalier. It's just um, up on the street. It's before Crooked Lane. It's that big. Right. Yeah. Isn't there a monument on the corner? Right. What's that? There's a monument on the corner. No, it's way before that. Way before. Way before. That. Okay. Yeah. Right out. Yeah. Right out here. So okay. There. And there's the one side. This back. is the also the one where if you ever get the chance, there's a really great footpath that goes off the end of Grove Lane. Oh yeah. That goes on the back side of all of these. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to give it up, but there's excellent berry picking at certain times. Grove Lane. <laughs> 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 So, uh, <laughs> if you get there at the right time, it's pretty good. Sure. Um, and it's a very underutilized trail. There aren't many yeah. people that yeah. use that. Yeah. Grove, yeah. The Grove yeah. Lane to Crooked yeah. Lane connector. I remember when I was there, it was pretty sketchy to drive on. Oh, but that being said, I would recommend a, a positive 2A that confirms the resource area boundaries for the vegetative wetland. Okay, we'll just bring it up. Is anyone in the public room? Okay, so I'm seeing not. Does someone want to make that recommendation? Okay. okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? No. Pass it now. Thank you. Our public is leaving quickly. Okay, certificates of compliance. All over at LLC 165 Road. All right, finally, this is the one we've been waiting for for a while. Um, for the certificate of compliance to get issued from the Board of Health, that it was installed to their standards. Um, all of the site rehabilitation and work from our inspection from a while ago was okay. Um, we were just waiting for that sign off. They provided their Board of Health. Certificate of Compliance, um, freshly signed by Artel Crowley mm. um, mm -hmm. the other day. Um, so as far as we're concerned, it's in compliance with their their permit and we recommend that compliance be issued. Okay. You want to make that recommendation? Uh, so move the issue. Yep. You have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No? Passes unanimously. Hassel. 10C crow's nest. Yes. So. This was for, um, this is one of the uh, the crow's nest cottages. For anyone that remembers those where it's that little group of like eight cottages that were kind of in the little horseshoe driveway. And this was for the, uh, uh, in addition with the deck um, on the existing dwelling, and they even reshingled the dwelling. Um, but it was built in compliance with what they did. They built the addition on the house in the right spot. Uh, and I recommend that this one could be issued as well. Okay. All in favor? Aye. All right. Any opposed? No. Five unanimously. Do we have a reissue? Yeah. Uh, Zabarucha. Zabarucha. 45 East, <laughs> Easton Street. All right. I'm just going to call it out because he put it in his email today. Keith Yankow lost the original before he recorded it, and he asked for a new one. <laughs> can't find it. I spent the better part of a week looking. So, uh, I get, he probably is going to find it in about two minutes. <laughs>
Okay, we have a second on the move. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? No. Very good. All shame. You lose it. <laughs> you admit it. Get a new fresh one. Okay. Very good. We're going to orders conditions. Nantucket Pond Coalition. Eastern Shore Public Pond Road. Did you guys want to discuss that one at all? Get some, some thoughts out. Well, your point about the uh, having a guideline or a, uh, a plan, a plan I mean, going I, forward. I have to say, I, I really have done a lot of research with my thesis on what all the forms of correction and the large number of wetland reconstruction projects nationally are unsuccessful because they don't have a plan. said they were looking for somebody local to take over the project. Mm -hmm. you know, there is nobody local. There is nobody local. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. No, I mean, I, that's that's really the gist of it. It's, you got you to gotta not only have a place, you have to have a company that's willing to travel here and be able to do it. So, um, I don't want to deny it. I just, I'm with you. I'm, you know, we need some yeah, assurances right. that this is going to get followed through on. Is there, ha is there native habitat coming back to, su to sustain populations? That's what? a concern. I mean, if, we're, if we go on and, and spray all this, and then with the assumption that, well, years from now, they'll come back, we can get rid of everything. You know, that's a concern I have. Is that a question to me? I guess it's a question. I, I was looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a concern. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. how much area we do at a, at a certain moment, and how much is how much is habitat coming back for the for all the bird population or we're we just gonna end up as sort of a you know sort of I don't want to say an unhealthy but sort of an undeveloped uh, bank, you know, and, and habitat for birds in here and, and then we have all this lovely insect population that's gonna not have anything to eat it. This one's longer than Cusco, but yeah, I don't know right. the I could mine it out if you gave me a few minutes, but. It did seem like it was twice as much. I think it's just one piece. Yeah. I mean, that's, to, to kind of answer that question, since you were looking at me again for all of that, um, I mean, I, I, I think it's a bit of a kind of a global discussion for, you know, managing habitats and how to do it, and it's always a, a concern for any of these things. I mean, I'll, I'll be fair and say that you know, when we get contacted by, and Ernie, don't throw anything at me, when we get contacted by the Land Bank or Audubon and they're talking about running their burn program, um, maintaining that program is always something that's a concern when you're talking about large-scale habitat management. I mean, whether it's 
burning or you know the regime that goes on in the the Serengeti for uh, I would say for for Harrier habitat was one of the main reasons at the start and it's mm -hmm. kind of changed from there but um big global changes like that are always interesting and in, in how you sequence those and how you phase those and how you mitigate the impacts of those but I think that's what your charge is to do is to look at that and say what conditions can we put in place to help it succeed as best we can and if it's not going to succeed what are the what are the consequences or what are the actions mm -hmm. and are those can you condition through that and that's the question I mean I don't want to be glib by saying this but if someone stops treating Phragmites and doesn't continue with the project historically what we've seen on all of these sites is the pretty regular return of Phragmites um, I mean you look at the Conce Spring sites that the land bank treated for a long time and they took a couple of years off from treating it and it came back really fast and that's I mean I'll, I'll be the first to say and I sit through a lot of meetings to talk about it I'm always nervous about people that get involved in a five to ten year project if you're lucky and then at ten years you get the luck of the relief of just doing the well now we have to watch for forever to make sure we don't see stuff coming back and you're chasing it forever. It's the same thing with erosion control projects is once you start you, you never there's no relief you never get to stop it's a constant vigilance. Jeff have we ever or has the uh, has the commission ever uh, requested that money goes into escrow? For a project like this? For a, yeah. like this? For a large scale habitat management project we have not we have requested them for erosion projects, yes, and that money is typically in for things like removal. It's kind of conditioned. Um, I think it would be an interesting condition. I don't, I don't want to get yelled at by our council later, but it'd be an interesting condition that you're required to have like a, to a contract with the, the company who's doing the work to go on file that demonstrates a certain time period of commitment that's there mm -hmm. that you could ask for that as a condition to know that it's going to continue and that I don't think that's an unreasonable ask to do and then if for whatever reason let's just say and not to pick on you Ben but if they hired shampoo landscaping to do all of the work I know they are not but if they were to and you were to go out of business or something were to happen then they would have to come back and address that condition whether it's their amendment or simply providing a new contract and saying they went out of business I had to get someone else mm -hmm. here's the contract for this new company to continue the work but that could certainly be a condition that that's provided that's not we do it for septic systems all the time yeah. for operation and maintenance agreements for IA systems um, whether we always get the ones for septic systems it's a different story but we chase down a, a, a few of them but I certainly think that would be within your ability to do well, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, a part of the concept of the plan, and, and they've already admitted that they probably won't, they don't have, they've, fought, they've lost their window to do it this year, so the last year, to, to do this spring this year. So, we well, I, I don't know, I don't know, know that's, that's still playing a fair amount of work. Yeah, I think they're yeah. talking about the 11th, and they're, they're, uh, about, they're going to take well, their chances, right? Well, well I think you, you go past that. Yeah. They're doing White Goose Cove on the 11th okay. under their other right. permit, and I think their intention was to do here this, this one as well. Um, uh, I mean, I wouldn't risk kind of thing, wasn't there? An at, at your own risk. Any work in the appeal period is always at your own risk. Um, is you know at the same time as the permit application came in at the end of July. So as I always say, you know, your procrastination is in my case for emergency. So, I mean, that's kind of how it goes. So, um, they're tough. I mean, that's that that's the hard part about these and, and having plans for these too is you're working with something that's going to be an unknown. I mean, when you go out and treat, you may get ninety percent removal, you may get fifty percent removal, um, and then how do you deal with with what's coming back and what's there? I mean, it's it's hard. I mean, projects like this aren't easy. I mean, you watch the the hair pulling that groups like the Land Bank and NCF have done about projects like this. Or, I mean, you even look at a 
a project like Water's Edge in the Dewey Creek, where they're still working on that large-scale kind of habitat management and restoration for their natural heritage uh, conservation and management, or an old farm. Like the amount of effort and time and length that goes into those is hard to do. And the thing that's even harder is the fact that you guys are issuing out a permit that's, you know, effective life for kind of starting the work is only three years, and the time frame of these projects three years is kind of warming up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's. I wish there was a permit that we were allowed to give that's like a 10-year management plan where you could sign on to it and modify it a little differently and deal with it, but unfortunately. Kind of like the yeah. yeah. Well, I think you can still yeah, have it's reporting. Easy. Yeah. Because it, it, it's stuff that, I mean, it's hard to predict what's going to happen to Hummock Pond in a year sometimes, let alone what's going to happen to it in three or five. And um, I mean, I think one of the things that, I mean, you can do to kind of safeguard the project right now is it's right now it's being requested in phases to do the southern end to the narrow section and then next year doing the narrow section to the north. Um, and one of the conditions that I kind of just, just drafted up to take a look at was um, that's the section that runs past Audubon and Land Bank and having their written consent for the work to go past there and requiring an amended order to do that to get that into the record that they've assented to that and that's also something that brings them back into an appealable permit mm -hmm. to review again before they start that other half that they've proposed and you can play little games with the, the rules to get them back in here and get their permit back under kind of full review for, for what's going on. Um, you know, do a lot, but I mean, it's cases like this where it's probably a better idea than not. Oh, Jeff, if I may, if they come in next year and then to do the rest of the pond and they get okay, just hypothetically, they just have two years under the permit then? Yeah, I think I mean, they would still be eligible for extension to do. I mean, any permit's always eligible for the three one-year extensions, and I think that's something that you can discuss at that time that, you know, maybe you require an extension permit to be filed as part of it. Um, you never know with these things, too, with any group, barring the, I mean, even the government to some degree, that funding goes away or something happens or there's a catastrophic event. I mean, we have a Category 5 hurricane like Irma that blows through Hummock Pond and it totally changes that system. You never know what happens. I mean, that's an extreme example, but it, it's, you know, trying to predict what's going to happen with all these systems over time is, you can take really good guesses, but there's always a, a little element of that. Now. Um, so I'll, I'll make it simple because everyone's yeah. still coming. Is you need to review it against the performance standards, yeah. and if it's meeting those or you can't condition those, then you go down a negative path um, right. for what's there, or you can review it and kind of decide what conditions would need to go on it to make it meet the performance standards. I think the way to do it would be require it to go for the duration of, of the permit yes. and then um, to build in something at the end that says prior to the, you know, something you would say, prior to the expiration of the order of conditions, um, you come in for your annual report and a component of that is application for an extension of the order of conditions. Mm -hmm. um, to yeah. go from there. I mean, that's. I mean, I don't know what the the sort of dollar value is per year, but I think that the initial contract could probably spell that out with whoever the applicator and say the first year was seven and a half thousand hundred dollars to do it. The next year it would probably be less. Yeah. Right. They could probably get a one year. Well, 
I think if you just say, you know, you'd like the the estimate amount for the first year of cost to be held in escrow for yeah, okay. the perpetuity of the right, permit. Sure. I will say to, to not to defend it, but for the gentleman who was here last week, Dr. Wagner is right. a pretty well regarded right. lake right. manager, especially within the, the Commonwealth. He's put together the project. I think, and I've said it, and I've said it to them, they could use more help on the on the ground science end as far as monitoring doing things. I mean, they use the land bank for Whitefish Cove to do to do that because they were involved. Um, and it's a it's a part of any of these projects, whether it's erosion or invasive species or restoration areas. I mean, someone that can go and do the plant work is is necessary. And with any herbicide, I mean, anyone that's applying the herbicide is you know has to be licensed within the Commonwealth to do commercially. So you know, it's yeah, not like that's the same thing. There's nothing about yeah. that they know what they're looking at. No, yeah. and they should. As long as we can tie whatever direction we're going to the information that we have on record of the performance standards, we can have a lot of flexibility to do that. I mean, simply right now, the proposal is really just for the non narrow section of Hummock mm -hmm. Pond south through the main body of the pond. That second phase is the narrow section um, to kind of the tip of the main body of the pond um, where the, it goes past where the other channel from Winnipeg goes in is the second phase, and that's not something that um, I would consider to be an active part of this permit right. at this right. point. Um, I know it was in their text, but it wasn't included in their original project area, but that would not be, that's the section that I was saying, if we were to do it, we would condition it, that it, we would require amending the order to put that in, and that would be a separate public hearing process. Uh, you could even throw in there. I mean, uh, I don't. I don't want to throw anything out there that you could also say prior to the the start of phase two, mm -hmm. a comprehensive survey of birds and mammalian life that are utilizing that area needs to be completed by a qualified wildlife biologist to do it, and then force it to come in as part of that amended order from there if that's the area of concern. I mean, there's really, I mean, the sky's the limit for what you guys can really ask for. I mean, that's. I think that makes more sense. I mean, <coughs> I like, I'm not, I'm not terribly opposed to 
what they want right now, but I think, as I say, if you let them know now, early in the game, then there's no, you know. Yeah. Well, I think so part like of what we, we told you this a year ago. Well, we this is what we were looking for. Because we asked yeah. for specific data points and then we could mark some things. And we heard a lot of excuses as to why we didn't get those measurements. The, um, yeah, if there was some question as to the invertebrate left. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Well, the first round of samples that were messed up on the other project, to be fair, were some of the glyphosate in the water samples. Right. Um, and the flushing of the pond. Yeah, Andrew McKenna did the invertebrate samples for the pilot project and had all of those in. So, I just want to... There were some problems, yes. Yeah. I just want to yeah. make sure because it's something we looked into. But that's certainly possible to do. I mean, I find it, I don't want to say troubling, but it, it's always concerning to me that you know, we always, for a lot of these projects, and not just this one, rely on things from natural heritage to talk about what's in their priority and estimated habitats. And then when they come back and they say to someone like Edie that they weren't even aware that some of these things were were there, or you would hope that they would identify it as potential habitat like they do for some of the plants and that they would ask those questions or, or go to look at it. And I know they have a an overwhelmingly large task to do with the whole commonwealth with what I feel like is a ever dwindling amount of people. I feel like they're down to like four. Um, but that's something that tells me overall that there's a lot of information that's lacking overall for some of these some of these areas. they don't consider it to be, you know, the words they always use are, it's not essential or critical habitat, and it's kind of the least desirable habitat, in their opinion. I've never once heard of DEP ever discouraging the removal of invasive species. I mean, that's, it, it doesn't happen. Um, I mean, it's, they value native populations over invasive obviously but I think their their preferences for conversion to native habitats and the hopes that you're increasing back to what your original diversity would be over time um, and that's kind of been their position for a lot of these I mean, that's why you see some of these gigantic natural heritage habitat plans that are for really large scale conversions back to, to native habitats from what they are I mean, or even removing in some cases you know, on the mainland or even here, you know, huge areas of, of scrub oak or something that's being utilized by a certain percentage of wildlife into something that's more representative of what the native populations used to be here. Um, and you see that encouraged, or some of the work like in Medewee Creek where there's been large scale Frank Mighty's replacement back into there, or salt marsh replacements. Um, they definitely kind of foster that along. Yeah. But I think that. You don't often see a lot of permits come in looking for, you know, at least out here for 4,000 linear feet of habitat replacement. And that's, right. you know, that's kind of what. And we sort of request so sort of a, sort of set of constraints because they're not planting habitat, but the success rate of recovery, I mean, it's of habit, free, you know, native habitat.
I just don't – I don't have the confidence that it's going to get followed through on. I just think it's a negative amount of feeling, honestly. Can we just admit it then? Do we have – no, we wanted more information from them. Yes. I thought we had it here. Well, especially where he's looking to go to Mike on the bond and the other bond. Yeah, it's not to say, like, now we need this. I mean, I'd be – I mean, if we didn't approve it now, would that – I mean, and then if they were planning to do it next year, say, and my understanding was that they weren't going to go ahead with it, but for this particular area. But if they – if we don't approve this one now, they can still come in for next year, apply for next year. So we do have a rehearing limit. So depending on what is issued from this closure, you would have to make a finding first that they either provided more information that changed substantively the decision that caused the original decision. I know that's a lot of decisions in one sentence. But you have to make that determination first to allow yourself to hear it. So you essentially waive that section of the bylaw that prevents people from – you know, you're supposed to wait three years to get reheard. You know, it's the I'm just going to keep applying until I get what I want prevention. So you'd have to first accept that they provide information that clearly demonstrates that it's changed the information that's there to go forward. And then you could hear it as normal if you went down that path. Yeah, I mean, the way I'm – like I said before, I'm not totally opposed to this phase, but I think it would sort of condition it that going forward you have a lot more requirements on, you know, on the recovery rates, on the plan for the next five years, and things like that. It's all the things we've been talking about. That's the way I look at it. Well, can we put a set of conditions together that gives them a roadmap for how this should go forward from here on? Or are we sort of stuck with we don't have enough information for that? I think that's where we're at. Yeah, that's sort of – I guess I was just pointing my own personal view on this one. So if it's incomplete, we do have a pilot project happening right now, and I think it's a good point that we don't have enough conclusive evidence on that. So what happens also if we approve it, and then you suggest on the 11th that it's within the community of Lucas, and someone appeals it? Well, that – yeah, I mean, that would be something that DEP would have to take up as a punitive action, or if someone appealed under the local bylaw and were to prevail on that, they would have to figure out some way to either rectify the damage or charge a penalty of that. I think that probably if we condition this thing to say, you know, you need a wildlife biologist, you need this, that, and you need money in us, but there's no way we're going to get that together by the 11th anyway, so we're going to lose our window. If they wanted to execute a project before the time window, we already know that. That's the reason to say this needs some grace and some more thought. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Well, like Jeff said, their emergency is not going to be approved until after the deadline. Their procrastination is not our emergency. Yeah, that's right. My grandma did very proud. I don't think they're going to approve it until after the deadline. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
a swallow who may be eating its body weight in insects on a daily basis that are mm -hmm. consuming, but those things that are there. But was there specific things that people felt like they, they clearly asked for in the public hearing that wasn't provided? Because if you deny for lack of information, it can't be something that all of a right. sudden we're sitting here right now going. That's top. Um, Well, I mean, it, it's going to be what it's going to be. I mean, that's – if you felt like there wasn't a clear – you would think, ask for – I don't think it – I don't think the, the follow-up was clearly defined. Yeah, but I mean, it's to – The follow-up manager. The internal gluttony of species are going to come back in to this area. Like, what's the new ecosystem they're going to create? Or are we just – Because I'm just going to play devil's advocate because I have to write this and want to put it complete in front of you, and it, 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 it makes it easier for me to do it. Is I guess if, if I were going to appeal that denial decision, I would come back and say, well, it's been permitted twice before, once for a project on a, one section of Long Pond and once for a similar, I mean, it's not similar size, it's, but it's a large-scale application project on Long Pond that we did this information for why was it sufficient then and not sufficient now? What else did we ask for? Um, I think one of the, the good pieces of information is there was a lot of information that was provided in regards to um, the bird population on Humic Pond and how it's utilizing that and that really wasn't addressed. Humic Pond also has a, you know, they had to go out and do a botanical survey for some rare plants that were there. Um, I think those are kind of two pieces to, to kind of counter that, but if there are, are more or things that people felt like weren't properly addressed or provided, um, that would the be things, things that we asked for before that weren't properly Correct. Also keep in mind, again, just I hear where it's going, but just trying to cover all of the bases and cross all of the T's and dot the I's is how does that impact either the information that we did or did not receive or how does that impact their inability to meet the performance standards? I mean, it's one of those, to, to kind of put it in a much simpler term, is we never ask the question of, can the builder go build the house that you've put on the plan? Right. And that's, you want to be careful of going down that where, you know, they're saying that we're going to be hiring someone to do the work, just saying, well, we don't believe you can do that is not something that you can necessarily deny a permit on because there could be someone somewhere that can do that work or do it or they could find them. That making sure that we tie that to either, you didn't give us enough information to do that or that doesn't meet the performance standards is where we have to link that together. I know that's kind of tricky because I, I totally hear what you're saying is you're dealing with something in a very long time frame that I think there's a general um, wariness of their ability to successfully complete the project. Um, but that, unfortunately, I think by the true legal standard isn't necessarily grounds for denial, but I think if you can tie it to performance standards or you didn't get enough information to feel that they could carry the project forward, then you could. We just need to do that analysis piece to get there. Was there success criteria built into the original order in the code? Not really. No. Because it was a... Because... Yeah. 
Well, it's one of those, like, I think we're really kind of caught in the conundrum that if we were to rewind the clock for all of us sitting around the table, and Ernie was probably on the commission back when we started talking about this, that we're kind of in a similar place that we were. If you look back at the orders for erosion control structures and how those permits and the condition requirements have changed over time, mm -hmm. I mean, you can go back to, like, the original Sconset projects, and their conditions are, man, I, I bet the people would kill for those conditions now because they, <laughs> they're they easy and they're not as comprehensive. I mean, Ernie has been through this longer than, than most of us that those orders have all evolved over time to build it in and I really feel like we're starting to this is pretty new. go through that process on projects like this and kind of getting all of the impacts addressed. At the same time, you don't necessarily want to burden people to the point where they're not willing to do any projects of this nature. I mean, this size is a different animal altogether, right. but you want to be sure that you're clear what's expected and that you're going to expect it. If someone wants to do 4,000 feet of pond and you're going to require, you know, birds and mammals and plants and insects and whatever you're going to require for that, if homeowners come in in a piecemeal fashion, you need to be ready to expect that same level of information from them as well. Hmm. And that's a little bit where the scales are. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's that's what's tricky about it is do you do it? I mean, I'll be fair and say I wish for the harvester project we would have thought more about the impacts of of what happened to the bottom or churning and have the harvester project um, helped enable the fact that we've had blue green algae blooms in the main body of Hummock Pond for the first time ever. It's super hard to to answer now because we don't have stuff in front of or behind. Is it, you know, coincidental that those two things line up? Maybe, but maybe not. I mean, there's a lot of research out there that shows now that disruption of bottoms, you know, cause blue green algae blooms. That those things, those things that are there. I mean, I tend to think that it probably is definitely fostering that along, but to sit around the table and think of that at the time is difficult to right. do. But I think that's what we're kind of at with these Fragmites projects um, that we really need to start thinking about large scale habitat changes and what's required information to be able to make that decision or you know what's the roadmap to get to the end. And I think that's the spot that we're kind of stuck in is we're caught between an approval mm -hmm. and you know growing up into, you know, real adult projects now. Yeah, well, that was sort of why I was sort of going for allowing this, this one and improving our, improving the next phase. I mean, it's like you say, it's just like a bluff. I mean, we, we, we learn so much more and we find more details to the concern and we write our orders better every time. But that was, that was my approach. Jeff, do you feel like I think it'd be really hard to be really honest because with the other with the other permits being out um, for projects of similar nature, we'd have to have some really concrete impacts. I think you could put a pretty good a pretty good run at it. I mean, I think the information that's been provided. I mean, I really thinking about it. I think that the information that Edie provided is really <coughs> critical to, to trying to do that, to saying, you know, we have testimony that this is a really critical piece of habitat for um, avian populations on Nantucket, and we just can't, we can't find a way to condition to do this project like this that's going to minimize or mitigate that impact, and our concern is that the overwhelming loss of wildlife habitat is going to, we can't condition on that. Um, it gets harder to defend when you can take a, a similar project in and have the argument with it. Maybe give it a go. Maybe no one tries to appeal it because you're getting the town to sign on the projects for some of these and if you don't appeal the town board, that's a different kind of political game to play. But you could do it. I think in this case, you're probably better to say if you're going down a denial path, you're better off going down the lack of information and clearing, clearing
clearly spelling out the information that you're missing and then the worst case scenario is okay it gets appealed it goes to court it goes to DEP and they say well provide the information and we're going to send it back to the Commission well you've clearly spelled out what you're looking for worst case scenario you get that information and then you rehear it and you issue out an order then to do what it is that you got to decide to do if it meets the performance standards or doesn't meet the performance standards. Mm -hmm. To me, I think that's probably the better path. My gut feeling tells me that if it if it goes down one of those two, um, I doubt you see an appeal in a case like this. Mm -hmm. My guess is you would probably just see a notice of intent that's a little bit more comprehensive um, for next season's application. That's my total total gut feeling um, yeah I mean some of it is some of it too I mean to, to be fair to the farm coalition some of it's a learning curve for them to figure out what it takes to get these permits and they're not just going to walk in and you know either pull their way to the end or just try to you know sell you on a project that some of it is figuring it out because I don't think it's any question that we've seen it before that our permits tend to get copied for other projects that are around, whether it's going to be a, a group of homeowners or the town or the land bank. Or, I mean, I can't tell you how many people Xerox and CFs invasive species protocols for things and include them in their permits or just write them in. I mean, that's it's kind of par for the course, but um, I think that's kind of where where it is. If you guys want to think about it, again, you don't have to issue a permit tonight. That's okay. Um, if you guys individually want to come up with things you feel like we're lacking or things you're uncomfortable, you can always email them to me or call me. Right. Don't email them to the group. <laughs> you know, don't hit the Conservation Commission group. Send it out there. Um, but it's certainly something that, that we can write. I mean, I'll admit I came tonight with a positive order that mirrors a lot of the stuff from Long Pond in case it went that way for discussion to help. Um, but it sounds to me like there are too many concerns and rightfully so if people are concerned that you know you got to have a, a standard to set. So okay. I have an idea from what we talked about enough and it's even something too that if I write it in a hurry, not in a hurry, but in the next couple of days I can always send out a draft to you guys individually, and again, don't respond with the reply all. If you have questions or concerns, because that's an open meeting law violation, but you can certainly reply with a, hey, I looked at this, and you know, I, I don't think that that was really kind of in keeping. Keeping in mind, you can't throw in a new piece that wasn't discussed during the public hearing. Like, right. as much as I hate to say it, you can't say in the order, um, we felt we had a lack of information about that because we didn't discuss bats in the public hearing. Should we have? Maybe. Um, I'm not saying for all of our public hearings going forward that we should be talking about, you know, every species of animal every time just so we're covered for something like that because we'll be here till 10 at night. But um, it needs to be relevant to the discussions that we had here. Um, and the good news is you can also tie it to the Long Pond Project because we talked to great ends about the projects at Long Pond and um, the lack of clarity for say for, for what's going on. So um, that is something to, to think about too. So the best to also to look at the consultants whether it would be good yeah. that they had provided them. their opinion, their uh, the third parties And, and keep in mind too, and this is something that it's, it's more of a pet peeve of mine than, than just about anything. Just because they permit things elsewhere doesn't necessarily mean you have to permit it here. Right. I mean, they permit lots of things oh, in, in other parts of the country that wouldn't pass muster here mm -hmm. or vice versa at times. So just because, you know, 
North Carolina has thought it's a great idea to do something doesn't mean that it meets our standards here or what our community is expected to do. And the reason why you guys are enabled locally to do it is to make decisions that are focused on your specific community within your rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. Not because, you know, the National Park Service thinks it's a good idea to annihilate Fragmites with glyphosate doesn't mean that the town of Nantucket Conservation Commission thinks that it's the greatest idea ever. So that's not a, a reason to approve projects. Right. Plus we have lots of bulkheads and seawalls and all kinds of crazy stuff going on. So all right, I have a good idea for that. Okay. Excuse me. I'll pass the rest of these on. Well, I'm not. I think that's enough for everybody. Just drop one for them. Yeah. All right. I'll try to draft that up for the next one. All I could think about was your seawall floor today. You're welcome. <laughs> hey, keep in mind. I mean, if you're stacking big sheets, we figure out Joe does six sheets. Yeah. So if you get above six, you're. Oh, three to four, the thing is on point. <laughs> so we're on Foley Mill. Foley Mill, three Foley Mill Road. Todd Johnson. This was the pool. construction. Yep. Should we put a lighting requirement yeah, in? Yeah. Sure. So at uh, 21, that all lighting shall be directed away from the resource area or down. That was one of actually one of Sarah's Octa's pet peeves about looking across the, the wetlands and staring at all the floodlights and all those Even houses. Lights, the way a lot of houses are positioned for yeah. second floor lights, they're so direct out the windows oh. that I mean they'll be getting bird strikes there all the time. I know, they do look at those big pieces of glass and think, huh? So we just want to say all lighting shall be directed downward. Yeah. <laughs> Turn your living room lights on or close your shades on that big glass. Can we also put it in there too? I just want to get in there. That all lighting shall be directed downward. No lighting shall be directed at the resource area. Yeah. Because I was just thinking about the second floor. And you could have it pointed down. And if it was out in an angle like a floodlight, then you still may be getting some for as much as it slopes. Just ask a question. Do you guys want to add that same condition about lighting to this one? It's another pool. Yeah. So. So that would be the same. Yeah. yeah. All lighting shall be directed downward, and all um, all lighting shall not be directed towards the resource area. So case there's nothing. Anything else? Okay. So I'd like to make that motion with the addition of item 22. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Pass it now. I started one for the land bank project too, but we can. Yeah. 156 Orange Street. 
Creekside nominee preps. So the only one I added this time was that one we've been requiring that no cultivars are allowed within the 50 foot setback. So no, we're just doing some law and general landscaping, but we've been kind of adding that to all of them. This was another pool. Um, <laughs> do we want to add yeah. that lighting condition to this one as well? Mm -hmm. I feel like we just need like sections of the regulations now that just say like if you are proposing a pool, just know that this is coming off the bat. Like right. there are new rules that this is just required by regulation on the pools. Doesn't right. mean the order. It's just the law. Yeah. Like it should be every brochure. Houses, anything. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's nice to have it in there because once I read them into these orders for pools, I honestly say that, you know, if we kind of have them as standards, I just copy and paste them from pool order to pool order, and sometimes they transfer. But I think the pool order is kind of like opposite. Oh, that, that, I mean, we should require a generator. Well, the, the, the pools and stuff, the equipment have always been outside of 50. Um, It is something too. I mean, not not for nothing, and not just cold. Well, here, let's make a motion to sign it, and I'll say what I'm going to say. Moved, issue as amended. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passing unanimously. Okay. Other business. Approval of minutes. Anybody have any comments on the minutes? Okay. And I will. There is no opposition. I will approve by unanimous consent. Action. All right, so just a quick update on 315 Pulpit Road, the one for the Frables. Uh, actually sent me some information about it the other day. Uh, we've met with the Frables now uh, twice in person and once on the phone, and we'll be out on site with them hopefully in the next week to go over how they would like to turn their property back into a farm. That's what they would like to do. Uh, so um, a lot of the area is outside of jurisdiction on the property, uh, but we're just trying to get him and his wife focused correctly. So we sent them off with their, their plot plan and said, mark up your plan for what you would like to do. We'll come out there, we'll figure out what permits you need to get and figure out what restorative actions that need to go on and then figure out if there's any penalty for what's gone on to this point. Um, but don't do anything inside the blue line that's on your plan. So um, Ashley sent a video that looks like they were kind of in the area with the machine, so I'll be out there probably before then to take a look at what they are moving around. But their intention is to have a, I'm trying to think of the nice, kind of like a homesteady farm. Like, I don't think that they, I don't necessarily <laughs> think they want to have it up where they're trying to sell Vegetables, I mean, I think in a pie in the sky dream, they would like to sell some. Knowing how little their property is, it's probably not very feasible. Um, and also have a small handful of chickens and those kinds of things to do it. Um, they have some big dreams and some limitations that I don't think they were aware of. Um, I mean, they're, the first time I talked to him, he thought he was on town sewer. And he is on septic. So, um, <laughs> pretty clearly. So, we are working through with them. Um, the other one, too, uh, we're still working with George on figuring out about how we cite outstanding enforcements um, for ticketing. Um, 
to do it because there are a number of people um, really kind of number one I don't say it on the record I'm happy to be number one on my bullseye right now is um, 36 Pokemon hasn't done anything and that was the we mowed four wetlands and those things um, they're applying for HDC applications to develop additional pieces of that property um, and they haven't complied with any of their enforcement requirements so uh, uh, I'd have to count, but uh, they're well over a year. So as far as I'm concerned, well, my also thought for it at this point is it would be $50 a day per violation. And you disturbed, they disturbed a minimum of four resource areas. So my thought would be at least 50 per resource area. And just to clarify if it's per day to say, we ordered you to do it. You got a permit to do it. You said you're going to do it. You didn't do it. Here it comes. This is it because it's there. There are other ones too. I mean, Can we send a letter to the chairman of the so we have a, a problem properties group in the town, and I have sent that around to them. Um, well, I, I will use another example. The, the problem properties list started um, because we had properties like Harry Larrabee's on Hummock Pond Road that were cross jurisdictional problems. <laughs> that no one was making any headway independently. Yeah. But <coughs> you know, when you could go and say you have six zoning violations, four health violations, a con, -con violation, you could present that all together, um, and usually in the presence of a police officer. Um, yeah. People pay a lot more attention to it, yeah. um, but it's also to kind of brainstorm ideas on how to deal with some of these that are, are problematic yeah. um, or people that are not responsive because that's – if you make it to that group, it's because you're choosing to not respond to conventional things. And some people that are in that list even uh, happily pay the fines that they get issued to them. And then they're like, all right, I paid it. See you later. Mm -hmm. And then you cite them again. And they're like, okay, I'm paying it again. And they pay it. So you're dealing with people that are habitual sometimes or, yeah. or just not choosing to. Um, it's one that I've kind of added to the list, but usually that's something that we get circulated through permitting agencies. So if one floats through there, you can kind of say, well, I know this is coming in for a permit. We have some other problems we need to discuss too. <laughs> but can we hold up other permits? What's that? Can we hold up other permits? Well, you can simply say, I mean, we don't necessarily have anything. We just stop the building permit. Yeah. 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 It, 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 it's there. Um, our permits do require you get an order of conditions that um, you're required to have all of the permits before you can initiate work. So that's one of those that if I know there's a problem with someone else, I can't necessarily hold up their permit for their application here, but you can certainly, you can find creative ways to address those issues through just about any board. Um, I mean, obviously, if the, something like the trim isn't painted the right color on the house, that's something that we don't really have an ability to address very well. But, um, at a staff level, we can certainly say, well, we know you have an issue of compliance here. Um, why don't you get that taken care of before you come in front of the board? Um, because you're not going to inspire a lot of confidence to do your project correctly when you're not in compliance with the other permits. Mm -hmm. So, I do know that if a letter is read at the HDC, that the message gets brought back either to the architect, the architectural designer, to the homeowner, and lets them know that everyone's walked in there. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying that we write the letter. Yeah, certainly. I'm more than happy to. Yeah. You guys, I'll take that as instruction then to send that to them. Okay. So, but we have a list that kind of goes around. Sometimes I wonder if John gets those. Yeah, I don't know if he does. Because they were getting into Andrew and Leslie for a while. Leslie kind of runs that group. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if they land in there and stop at her desk or mm -hmm. don't get there. Going. So, <laughs> <laughs> and there's just, there's, there's so many. I mean, yeah. they include all the places that have failed septic systems things that are there so the list is the list can get vast so and it's really nice because the police maintain the list for us because they have all the where they all sit because they have to take them all to court sometimes and it helps us set up to file any criminal complaints that we need to if someone gets a penalty that they are wanting to challenge or just refuse to comply with it then the police can just file their criminal complaint and go from there it's awesome I mean, some of it's interesting. Some of the problems are pretty wild. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but they're pretty vast. So we're 
George and I are still puzzling that out because our bylaw is very unclear about how to deal with that. So, and maintenance with state law that requires specific penalties for specific things, um, and whether or not we may have to send out a. And I know this sounds terrible, but to send to some of those say if you can't bring yourself into compliance within the next 30 days that you're going to be assessed the full penalty, you know, here's your last chance from your last chance because we're trying to figure that out. It's just, it's taking longer than we thought and to be fair, um, the Baxter Road event kind of preemptively struck on that while we were trying to figure out how to make sure that we were handling that within our legal ability. So, sorry, that's where we are. I'll stop talking because I've been talking a lot lately. No. Um, all right, just real quickly, um, I'll go over this. I've been reminding people. Um, I'm going to be missing at least one meeting in October. I won't be here. Joanne will be here in my stead. Uh, but after I return, uh, I've been threatening this for a while, I'm going to advertise and post regulation updates because we have a lot that we need to discuss and do and get in front of people. Um, and then they also need to get in front of you guys the language that we've um, I've kind of roughed out for a bylaw change at town meeting to take away the language there that says the commission can up to a up to a three hundred dollar violation per day blah, 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 the one that isn't applicable mm -hmm. by state law um, the language right now is kind of focused to say that it's going to say the commission essentially the commission can adopt a schedule of of penalties for violations as part of the regulations. We're going to move that authority from the bylaw to the regulation. So it would be a lot more like Board of Health regulations or shellfish regulations that have penalties that are there in the regulations that are clear. So you guys can adopt those at a regulatory level. So if they need to be changed or adjusted, they're easier to do. Um, and they can also be a lot more flexible that way. And then we're not relying upon town meeting to set those because right now we're suffering from the fact that there's no clear set penalty. So we'd have to adopt in our regulatory changes if it goes through. Um, so my thought is to do the first set of regulatory changes and then just do the table after town meeting if it goes through in April. Um, I mean, it can be everything from as simple as a missed monitoring report costs you 100 bucks, and we just have to track that and say, you didn't get them in, here's your 100 bucks, pay up. Um, and you still owe us the report um, to things where I've um, been doing a little bit of research as far as how other communities do it. And to me, it, it makes some sense where if you set the penalty, there's still limits to criminal penalties, but they're crafty because you essentially can set the penalty to be based upon like square footage or linear footage or things like that that get around the whole idea of the $300 criminal area by essentially saying that if you have a coastal bank and you alter 100 feet, you essentially have like 100 little mini violations if it's by a linear foot. So you can play kind of Mickey Mouse games with it. But it gives you the ability to say things like, if you have a violation on a coastal bank that caused an alteration to a coastal bank, instead of charging you $50 per day, is we're going to charge you a dollar per linear foot that was altered for that same time period. So if you altered 200 feet, now you're at $200 a day to set penalty. Uh, bordering vegetated wetlands in a lot of communities, they charge an amount per square foot altered of resource area. And I've even seen one community that does square footage for the resource area, and then they have a different rate for square footage of the buffer zone. So you would do like, it's a dollar per square foot of resource area altered, and it's 75 cents per square foot of buffer zone altered. Um, to do it and then you can assess the penalty from there. So there's lots of choices and we can kind of discuss those when we get there. But to me, I think it's important to put into the regulations. So 
five years from now when the dollar isn't worth a dollar anymore, if it's really two dollars, is you can simply just post the public hearing, have the public hearing here, adjust the rates, and you're not going to town meeting to do it, and you still stay on the good side of Mass General Law to do it. So that seems to be the most adaptable and sensible way to do it. So it would be a new section in our regulations that's just called enforcement and violations. So it's clear and something that may even just say, if you come in, we're going to just assess you the penalty up front. And if you want to come in and try to discuss why you don't have to pay the penalty to the board, the board can then waive the penalty or reduce it if they want to, or they can just say, no, you're sorry, there you go. There's your $2,000 fine. Have a nice day. And it gives you a little bit more. So, yeah. Cool. Well, the first regulatory changes I would like to do in November into December. Um, and then the violations one, um, we have to change the bylaw first. And it's not going to be on for a special town meeting because that was already set. So we're kind of looking at April. Um, but keep in mind, if we do put it on for the regular town meeting, which I think we should, um, we may be asking some of you as members if it comes up or happens to be called to be prepared, maybe the chair, to say why, it, why it's important as a commission member or someone else that's designated or if all of you want to get up and say why it's important that would be awesome because that I mean I can talk to them blue in the face and they'll be like whatever but if it comes from the board to say this is a problem that we have we want it fixed it's not to penalize people it's to make sure that everyone is being treated fairly however you guys want to put it um, it would probably mean a lot more to the voters there to have a board member speak we can designate Joe right now <laughs> Thanks for volunteering, Joe. Good job. But it, it is a problem, to be fair. But also, if That's people have specific smart. areas that they want addressed, no, um, <laughs> going to make me do it. <laughs> they want addressed in regulations. Please send them in, um, and we can do some research to see if other people have looked into those before, or have some thoughts or ideas. Um, send them so we can kind of be ready. Because we found that trying to draft on the fly doesn't work. And having them put together for people to review is much faster. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. And now I'll, I'll, I'll stop because it's almost 6.30. So. I have to say. Yeah. Okay. okay. You okay. Can do adjourn. I can ask a motion to adjourn. Is there a second on that? Mm -hmm. All in favor, aye. Aye. Good job. Oh. Oh.